uh, meeting. I'm Councillor Majok. I'm joined my, by my fellow councillors, Councillor Hogan, uh, Carderell Driscoll, Madam President, and Councillor Chos. Uh, I am in uh, sitting in for uh, Councillor Peniawa. She had to take care of some stuff, and she's uh, so she's not here today. So, as a member of the Education Committee, I have a pleasure to sit in today for her and with the rest of my councillors. So today is an update from the City School District. So we are just going to hand it to you. Take it away, Superintendent. Yes. Well, while the superintendent is passing things out, I am so excited to see all the city school district staff. Uh, it's, it's such a great day today because it, we haven't had this much luck to see everyone in the same room like this. So welcome to all of you, and I'm excited for uh, what we are going to be talking about here today. And thank you for all you do for our district. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to be here today to share with you uh, our accomplishment in the Syracuse City School District during the last six years as tenure, during my tenure as superintendent of the Syracuse City School District. Uh, with me this afternoon, I brought part of my team uh, doing the work that we do every day I can't do it by myself, it's a team effort. So with me this afternoon, we have the Chief of Staff, Monique Wright Williams, Chief of Operation, Dean DeSantis, Chief of Accountability, uh, D, uh, Tim Moon, the money lady, no, just, the Chief Financial Officer, Suzanne Slack. Right next to uh, Suzanne Slack is the former uh, Assistant Superintendent for secondary education and CTE, and soon to be interim superintendent for the Syracuse City School District, Mr. Anthony Davis. He knows what he's getting, he's looking forward, he's asking for the keys already. <laughs> what? Just having, no, just kidding. We gotta have a good sense of humor in this business all the way, you know. Uh, in the back, we have Laura Kelly, Chief Academic Officer. Mike Ortiz, who is the Chief Student Support Service and Chief Ombuds. Uh, Melissa Evans, who is the Executive Director for uh, Elementary Education. Lisa Wade, who is the Chief Human Resources. Uh, Tara Jennings, who is the Assistant Executive Director for uh, Secondary Education, CTE, and everything else that I ask her to do between 9 and 10 o'clock at night. Pam Odom, who is the Executive Director for uh, Secondary Education and Career uh, CTE and Adult Education, and Dr. Rob DiFlorio, who is uh, Executive Director for uh, Elementary Education, also working with the K-8 school. So again, thank you for giving me the opportunity, and they are also here to answer questions that you may have. Uh, six years ago, I was asked by the Board of Education uh, to be interim superintendent of the Syracuse City School District. Uh, that was in July 2016. After that, in October, the board offered me the opportunity and the honor to be the superintendent of the Syracuse City School District. Uh, a job that I have taken very seriously and my team also has taken very seriously. I will be completing 39 years, five months, and something else oh. as an employee of the Syracuse City School District. <laughs> it has been an honor, a privilege to work with uh, our students, with our families, with the people from the city of Syracuse, with elected officials. So it is my job to do everything that I can to support the kids and the students in the Syracuse City School District. Uh, the uh, 2017, we, gather a group of people together, uh, including 
staff members, elected officials, community members, students, and we develop our mission and our vision for the Syracuse City School District. So our mission was to build support, not was, is, and sustain school communities that provide all students with high quality education that prepares them to graduate as responsible, active citizens, ready for success in college and careers, and prepared to compete in a global economy. Our vision was to prepare and inspire all of our students to innovate locally and contribute globally. And that vision became a reality uh, during the last two years as we had to deal with a pandemic that was a global pandemic. And we have our students in the classroom, we have students at home, we have teachers in the classroom, we have teachers at home working and doing work to get an education. So based on those, uh, the mission and the vision statement, we had also five priorities in the district. The first one was to engage families and community. Educating our students, educating our future is not the responsibility of uh, only the teachers in the district. It takes the entire community to get our students ready and our uh, families engaged. Also, to implement culturally responsive practices. We have a very diverse student population. We need to take into consideration every uh, student in the district, every STEM member, and we need to make sure that we recognize every one of them. We needed to recruit, develop, support, and retain the most effective diverse staff. We know that our teachers are in the classroom every day, but it's not only the teachers, it's also the people that work in the budget department, it's the people that work in the cafeteria, it's the driver that take the kids home or to school every day. So we needed to hire and provide support to all uh, our staff. We needed to personalize learning for students. Every student is different. Every student is a gift. Every student has different talent. So we needed to make sure that we were making uh, instruction personal for every student. And we needed to provide a dynamic, rigorous curriculum and instruction to make sure that when the kids were coming to school, they were being engaged, that they were getting quality education, that we were challenging them and providing them with the best opportunities to learn. So I'm gonna go over some of the things that we have done in the different department, and I'm gonna begin with the Office of Family Engagement, because again, to educate our kids, we need to include the parents, we need to include people in the community. So our family engagement department, we have four great family engagement facilitators. Each one of them is assigned to one of the quadrants in the city. One that works with the, all the schools that fit into Henninger, PSLA, Corcoran, or uh, Nottingham. So each one of them has a group of school, but not only they work with the school, but they also work with some community agencies like the South Community Je a a Center, the Northeast Community Center, the Spanish Action League, different people and different agencies in the community. We gotta do that work together. We also added, uh, thanks to the support of the board, a parent aid or program aid in each one of our school. So we have a person that is working directly with the family, that is working with the student, that is working uh, getting the kids engaged, that is working to make sure that they're coming to school every day. So also we have a social work assistant and nationality workers, because we wanna make sure that we are communicating with our families in different languages, that they get the message from us. So we have staff members that they speak quite a few languages. So these staff uh, are in every building, uh, they provide translation services. They offer or get clothing uh, distribution for their families, toys for the kids during Christmas time. Uh, they help get uh, school supplies. Uh, they implement or help implement the parent engagement notebook or the pen. This is a notebook that we use to communicate with parents from kindergarten, from pre-K all the way to high school. So it helps the parents to track attendance, to track the policies in the district, uh, to monitor academics, to monitor the 
22 credits that the student needs for graduation from high school to monitor the regents exam, whether they have passed them or not. All that information is included in our pen notebook. Uh, they connect our families with other agencies in the community. And as I said before, they also provide attendance support. One of the things that we learned during the pandemic is that there are different ways to engage families. And I have to give credit to Chief Williams and the Family Engagement Department because during this pandemic, we were able to reach more families than we had in the past. We had 137 co-video chats that were offered from October until May. Those co-video chats including topics such as the reopening of the schools uh, in August, uh, COVID-19 and vaccination clinics information, kindergarten instruction or information, uh, school town halls, career connections, uh, meetings with Syracuse Parks and Recs to talk about what are the services that are there, what are employment opportunities for kids during the summer, uh, stress reduction techniques, FAPSA uh, obligation help for the students at the high school level, uh, getting ready for high school for students entering ninth grade. Uh, so that department has increased participation uh, from our families from probably 10% to more than 100% that we had in those meetings. So again, they have been very proactive getting uh, the families engaged. And parents are not afraid of joining us and asking questions. And, making sure that we're accountable for the things that we're saying that we're going to do. Also, another area from the uh, Family Engagement Office, and this is mostly Chief Williams, something that she began before uh, she was Chief uh, of Staff, is the HBCU tour that we take uh, our students to uh, some colleges and university all the way from Pennsylvania. We have gone all the way down to Florida in the past. So some of the universities that they have visited are Howard University, North Carolina, AT&T, Bowie State, Virginia State University, Lincoln University, Cheney University, Morgan State, uh, Florida AMM, Morehouse, Spelman College, Clark Atlanta University. So this is a great, great opportunity that our kids have. Yes. Can I ask a quick question? So with the HBCUs, are any of those on the say, say yes list? Yes. Yes, there are some. Okay, thank you. So it is a great opportunity. Some of the kids have the opportunity to be admitted right on site. Uh, we also take our uh, staff from the HR department, and we also do recruitment. They recruit our kids, and we recruit students from there to come to Syracuse and become teachers uh, in the Syracuse City School District. It is a great opportunity. The kids get financial aid uh, offer, admission offers, so it's a wonderful, wonderful experience. For two years, the first two years of COVID, we were not able to do it, but this April break, we were able to get a group of how many, almost 40 kids? 27. 27. And some chaperone that spent the week during the April break going to HBCU. Anything that I forgot about the trip? No? Okay. Thank you. Uh, in the area of teaching and learning, uh, that is our main uh, job. We are about teaching kids and making sure that they're learning. In April 2015, uh, the chapter 56 of the laws of 2015 added receivership. And at that time, uh, in the Syracuse City School District, there were 18 schools that were identified as a school in receivership. These are schools that are not uh, making academic progress. So uh, they were put on the list by uh, the Commission of Education. Right now, we only have two schools left in receivership. Lincoln and Clary Middle Schools. And I will say that it should be just only one because of Lincoln, uh, two years ago, made the magic number that it was the 67% for uh, student achievement. But the commissioner at that time uh, didn't think that it was enough. And there are three schools that we needed to restart. They were not making uh, significant progress. 
Those were uh, Dr. King, the old Danforth, and uh, the old Blodgett. So Dr. King was uh, redesigned as a STEAM at Dr. King. We have a science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics program in the building. Uh, we have developed a program that support the kids that are participated in the school in partnership with Blue, uh, Blue, uh, Blue Point 15. So we have done a lot of work to support the students at Dr. King. At Danforth, uh, we changed that to be Brighton Academy, and we're implementing the expeditionary learning program there. That's a program at the middle school level, a program that we have at the Elm schools down in the valley, and that has been successful. So the students there uh, were building capacity to ignite each student motivation, persistence, and compassion to propel growth and success in school, college, career, and in life. Uh, we have seen an increase uh, in the number of students going to Brighton Academy and an increase in academic achievement. Are we there yet where we need to be? No, but they're working every day. We have seen a lot of family engagement in that building, community engagement. Two weeks ago, there was a sneakers and cleats giveaway there. So there were quite a few agencies providing support to the student in that community. Mentioned Dr. Keith. And at STEM at Blodgett, uh, Blodgett was changed to STEM, Science, Technology, and Engineering and Math in partnership with uh, Lamont College and other universities around. We did not include the arts in there. It's not that we left it out, it's just right now. Uh, Blodgett does not have an auditorium, it's part of the next phase of JSCB. So we hope that in the future we will also be including the art at STEM at Blodgett. Uh, there's partnership with, as I said, with Lemoyne. Uh, the teaching methods are inquiry-based and a student center. Uh, they do a lot of work with uh, the CTE programs, the pathways at STEM uh, PSLA. So it's a great team that we have there that are working to support our kids. In 2017, we were looking at our student achievement carefully we knew that our students needed some extra support in both in reading and in math. And we began the implementation of uh, early reading intervention rooms at the elementary level, or those are what we call ER. Not ER just in the hospital, but ER as an early reading. We want them to be ready to read by second grade. Because if they're ready to read by second grade, then they're gonna be more successful. We know that a lot of the work that they do is based on reading. So we wanted to make sure that our kids were getting that instruction. We knew that we already have kids in the pipeline, that they had some deficiencies. So we uh, introduced intensive reading or IR rooms at the intermediate level, operational reading for uh, middle, and the recovery reading rooms at the high school level. We wanted to make sure that all our kids were getting support for reading instruction. This year, we began to do something similar for math, and we uh, began to open QR rooms. And QR rooms are called quantitative reasoning. We want to make sure that our kids are also getting support in math. So we want to make sure that when they graduate from the Syracuse City School District, they are successful in reading, math, and they can be productive citizens in the future. Uh, another thing that we learned through the pandemic is the need for social emotional support that we needed to uh, provide to our students, our staff, and our families. We needed to take care of everyone in the district. And during the year that we were doing hybrid instruction in the district, that we have kids two days at, uh, during the week with us, two days doing remote, and one day for professional development. We were providing social emotional lessons to uh, the teachers in person or WCNY, that partnership that we have uh, to provide instruction for our kids. It's been great. Uh, I have to say thank you to WCNY. I have to say thank you to many agencies in the community that they step up to provide services to our students and to support our staff. Uh, again, hybrid instruction for every kid in the district, two days in person, and three days doing remote instruction. Uh, during that time, we knew 
that our kids needed to have more technology available for them. They needed to, to, to have more connectivity. And later on, I'm going to get into uh, some of the equipment that we bought it in the district to support our students in the district. Our curriculum, we wanted to make sure that it was uh, cultural, culturally responsive, that all that were, our lessons were uh, culturally responsive, the books that we were buying, everything, we had a tier of support. We hired coaches, diverse co coaches to support our students, to support our staff, and the board was very supportive, making sure that we got those extra positions and that we have the support that we needed for our students and staff. I'm not gonna go through every single one because otherwise I'll be here forever. <laughs> Sorry. Is that okay with you? Yes. yes. <laughs> I know there's a mask and all that, so. Another area is the graduation rate in the Syracuse City School District. That has been a priority for years in the district. We have been working very hard to make sure that our kids are ready and that they can graduate from high school. So we saw an increase in graduation rate. When I became superintendent, it was 63.6. .6. Uh, this past year, it was 77.2%. Uh, there had been many things that we had put in place to support our kids. We know that some of them didn't have to take all the region's exams, but I can testify that every single student did graduate with the 22 credits that are required by the state education department to get a high school diploma. So uh, we have seen an increase in all the subgroups on the African-American, on the Latinos, on the minorities. So we have seen the, an increase in graduation rate our EL students, uh, we have seen an increase there. In 15, 16, it was 34%. Uh, we have seen an increase in the graduation rate, so we have seen a reduction of 10%. So many things are happening to our kids, to our students in the district. And I have to give credit to also, not only the staff, because the staff is doing a great, great job, but also the CTE pathway that we have in the Syracuse City School District. We have 27 different pathways, so our kids can get a high school diploma. And if they want to go to college, they can go to college and be successful. But if they want to join the job market, they can get a decent job and make a decent living. We have kids from ITC, from our PTAC program, that they chose not to continue, and they were getting job for $60,000. So we're working very hard to make sure that our kids have all the skills that they are going to need to be successful in the future. Moving to another office, the Office of Student Support Services, uh, under the previous leadership from uh, Patty Clark and now Mike Ortiz, they're working with community agencies to provide support to our students, to our families in the district. In this department, we have included uh, counselors at all levels in the Syracuse City School District. We used to have counselors only in the middle, K-8 and the high school. Now we have a guidance counselor at all level. We have included SEL uh, resources that uh, our fa students can use. Uh, second step is for K-8, and we have overcoming obstacles for the high school students. Uh, they have revised the code of conduct to provide support and to make sure that our families understand that there are some behaviors that will not be tolerated in the district. They work with attendance teams in the building to monitor our students' attendance, and they also conduct, conduct a climate survey uh, for our students, staff, and families to make sure that we get feedback on how, we go, how are we doing so we can move uh, and plan forward for that. Uh, we have, again, the multi-tier system of support uh, that are based on partnership uh, with community agencies. So we have partnership with ACCESS. We have 37 specialists uh, assigned to our buildings. We have also family support for student success uh, that has 36 specialists in our schools. And we have promised son specialists in our buildings also. We have 29 of those. So we have partnership with Contact Community Services uh, youth development program uh, and the student assistant and also we have the youth advocate in the middle and the high school through our hillside program so we are working to provide different uh, support to our kids 
uh, at the tier three level, we have 35 mental health practitioners assigned to schools through the following agencies. We have providers from Arise, Liberty Resources, and the school-based health centers. We wanna make sure that our kids are getting support and that the support is on site. Sometimes parents do not have the time to take a kid to an appointment, so we wanna make sure that the kids are getting that ser those services on site. For next year, the Board of Education made a commitment uh, based on our recommendations, and we're gonna add another mental health counselor to each school in the Syracuse City School District. So we wanna make sure that the support, again, is on site where the kids are. We have partnership with other community agencies. We have the Good Life Foundation that is working with the students at Clary, Lincoln, Henniger, Stemma Blodgett, and PSLA. We have a street addiction working with Brighton Academy, Corcoran, and Grant. And we have contact community services that they have youth advocates in the middle schools and the student assistant counselors at the high school level. Any questions so far? Uh, in the area of human resources, uh, this is an area that we are putting a lot of effort. Uh, the workforce for education is not there. There are not many people choosing to go into the field of education. So we have been working uh, with other colleges and universities so we can develop a pipeline for future teachers in the district. And this pipeline is to give priority to people who live in the city of Syracuse. We want our teachers to live in the city. Uh, we want our TAs to live in the city. Uh, and we are creating those pipelines to get uh, people uh, that look like our, our kids and that live in the city. So we have a partnership with, for teaching assistant with Onondaga Community College. We have the Syracuse University Urban Fellowship Program. We have a program with NYU, a residency program and another program with SUNY Oswego. Now Lemoyne is also interested in working with us and Colin State, so we will be developing partnership with all those two universities to make sure that we have the workforce that is needed in the Syracuse City School District to provide our students with the best education. Superintendent, we, I yes. just wonder, just, you mentioned city residents. Uh, do we have a percentage, we used to have a percentage on city residents who work for the school district? Uh, I will provide you about that information. We have increased, that's a priority. No, I, yeah. I remember us talking about this before. Yeah. You did had in, increased it quite yeah. a bit, so yeah. thank you. But I will provide you with that information. So again, we also have our own Grow Your Own Teachers. So we have one of our pathways at Corcoran High School, a teacher preparation program. And these kids, when they graduate from high school, they are able to get a certificate as a teaching assistant. If they want to work, they can get a uh, tuition from us, or they can go full time, get say yes, and get their degree and come back and teach in the Syracuse City uh, School District. We also have some recruitment initiative. As I said before, uh, Chief Williams takes a group of people from HR. They are very happy to go on the trip. What they don't know is that they're going to work. So they have to chaperone the kids and they have to do some recruitment down there. And we are also sending uh, some people to Puerto Rico to do recruitment down in Puerto Rico and other colleges. So. Do you need we, assistance? Okay. I'll volunteer. <laughs> <laughs> we do, we can always, you know, add people to come. I mean, but I want people that are gonna come and or go and say, come to Syracuse, it's the best, it is summer all year long <laughs> once they get here they can see that there's a little difference in the weather but you know six weeks of cold weather or 12 months of heat so right so uh, we are also uh, working with one of our state member in operation Socrates program and this is a partnership with some colleges and university uh, to recruit veterans to the field of education uh, our Veterans are doing a great job working with our kids, and we created a position in HR to support uh, this program. Uh, we're working with SU, Oswego, working with Colin to make sure that we can engage uh, military people who are interested again in the field of education. 
Uh, we are working with Brian Stratton uh, for a program for nurses. Uh, it is a field that there's also a need. I can tell you that this year, we have to close schools for five days and it wasn't because we didn't have the staff, the teaching staff, because we didn't have enough nurse to cover. So uh, we're working with Brian Stratton to do that. Uh, we established uh, affinity groups uh, in the district from our HR department to provide support to our African-American, to support, provide support to our Asian students and staff, to provide support to our Latino students, staff, and to provide support to uh, our gay, lesbian community, all that. So, I mean, Mrs. Diversa is doing a great job communicating uh, and providing support. Sometimes she's at the airport waiting for people to land and get them a place to live and provide some support in their community. And we also have a telemedicine option to provide services, uh, support for our staff. So our HR department is not only about hiring, but it's about providing services so we can retain and support the staff in the district. The Office of Shared Accountability, uh, they have done a lot of work during the last two years, and not even during the last two years before that. Uh, we have the Smart School Bond Act that uh, supported personalized learning throughout the district by establishing a three to one device to student ratio in the district. So before the pandemic, we had three, uh, we had a laptop for every three students in the district. Uh, with the support from the Smart Schools Bond Ad, we were able to add more laptop, more equipment so we could support our students during the pandemic. We were able to prepare over 12,000 devices for students to take home and provided over 3,000 Wi-Fi hotspots so they could connect from home and do the work. That was one of the things that we learned from uh, COVID-19, that we needed to be ready to make sure that our students had the devices, the equipment that they needed. And I said that at that time, instead of having 4,000 employees, we have more than 15,000 employees because we also have to work with our families. Our family engagement department and our staff was uh, librarians were ready working with our uh, parents to teach them how to connect, how to prepare the kids to go into uh, CISO, Canvas and all that. So it was a great, great effort. And I have to give a great, great shout out for our IT and our uh, teachers in the district. Yes, sir. Yes. Question for you. Okay, I know that when COVID hit, it took a lot of folks working together to make things happen. Because mm -hmm. one of the young men that was delivering food popped up in my phone because I took a picture of him, right? It was nice. Um, but I just want to ask you because you have the devices out, you have all the Wi-Fi hotspots, you've done the preparation for food, so if we had to go back in lockdown, we're ready to just move forward quickly, right? We're ready. We're ready. That's one of the things uh, that we learned from the pandemic, that we need to be prepared all the time. That's one of the things that I've been working with uh, Chief Accountability Officer, with uh, the Chief Financial Officer, and with the Chief Academic Officer to make sure that we have the devices. Uh, one of the things, one of the lessons that we learned was that we sent more than 12,000 devices home. Not all of them came back. So we needed to purchase more in order to be ready in case that something happens. We wanna make sure that if something happens again, we have to be ready. So in the, in the future, you foresee having to act, actually buy extra devices every time, correct? We have extra devices, and in September, we're gonna begin the one-to-one -one, uh, device program at the high school. So all our high school students will get a device next year that they will keep throughout their four years in high school. So every student will have a device for 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th grade. Thanks. It's a laptop, right? It's a laptop, yes, because my chief accountability officer does not believe on Chromebooks. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> laptop. No, not only about laptop, but we want to make sure that our kids have the equipment that they really need to do the work at home. 
uh, we have kids in CTE education that they need to have good devices to run programs, so we want to make sure that those devices are ready for them. And I also have to say that the Allen Foundation, uh, NAN, uh, Cherokee, other agencies in the community provided our kids with laptops or Chromebooks, so we will not say no to a Chromebook. We'll take them, but we work uh, with other community agencies that they provided support to our kids. So every student in the Syracuse City School District had a device during the year 1920 and 21 school year. So uh, some of them had their own, some of them had devices from, from us, but every single student, all 20,000 kids had a device and more than uh, 3,000 hotspots so they could uh, connect. We also, uh, again, got to give credit to our IT department. They put hotspot outside of our high school. So if people didn't have the hotspot at home, they could go into the uh, parking lot and they could connect and do some work. We were not encouraging that, but that was another service that we made available to our students and our families. So superintendent, there's encapsulated somewhere, there is a uh, lessons learned from what President Hudson said. Yes. Uh, yep. So it's a go-to manual in case we have to ever do that again. I have a folder with everything, every memo that Looking came from the state. Superintendent Davis. That is, yes. <laughs> yeah. Because, I mean, I think there were some valuable lessons learned there, and I, I have to commend everybody here, you know, for the flexibility and the way they reacted to a crisis. Yeah. You know, I mean, not only here in City Hall, but actually out there with those, those kids in the school, so. It was a team team effort. I mean, it's coming to you for support and approving our plans, going to the board, and the board making a commitment that you know what well, we're going to go into the fund balance. And we're going to we need that equipment now, so we're going to buy it. Uh, like what is happening now, uh, it took you know some time for some of the equipment to come in, but we made sure that you know every student had the equipment that they needed to be successful, and we're ready uh, for next year. Hopefully, COVID. Uh, I don't think it's gonna be something from the past, but it's something that we will continue to be prepared because you never know. It's a lesson that we learned. I mean, 20 years ago when I was a teacher, we probably would have closed the schools or we probably would have been making copies and, and delivering copies to the kids, the old digital machines and all that. Now with technology, we were able to provide, you know, synchronous teaching, a teacher in the classroom or the teacher working from home, working with the kids and the kids getting engaged in the process. And another thing that we learned that is very important is that kids were working at their own pace. Our IT department was checking when they were doing work, homework. Kids were engaged from nine o'clock, eight o'clock in the morning until 10, 11, or one o'clock in the morning because they were doing it at their own pace. And the information was uh, on Canvas, so they had access to all that information. So that is something that we're gonna, gonna have to revisit in the future because, I mean, sometimes we talk about attendance for kids, especially middle school and high school. Those kids, they would like to sleep in the in, in the morning and start school a little later, because mm -hmm. we saw that they, they didn't have any problem staying up all night to do work. So that was another lesson that we learned through this pandemic. Can I go a little off? topic for a minute yes okay so we're talking about technology and we're talking about the use of the computers right so I'm just speaking candidly I had a kid in, tw in the Twilight program and the Twilight program to me was really a waste so is there a way maybe you can do it with technology and have those kids do it that way mm -hmm. Again, another lesson that we learned from the pandemic is that uh, we don't need to have all those programs at the end of the day and all that, that kids can connect during the day, that all we have to do is to give them the device. If they don't have connectivity at home, give them a hotspot and they can do that. We don't have the Twilight program anymore. So we are providing services to the kids. Some of the kids are doing remote. Some of the kids are in uh, community centers throughout our community. But we learned that they can do work from home with a device. I will always say that a computer will not replace a teacher. Right. Never. And especially at the elementary level. So we have great teachers in the district. But it's another way for us to provide education to our kids.
that they need some extra support. We know that we have some kids that they didn't feel comfortable, they were afraid of coming to school because they were gonna catch the virus and this and that. So we were able to provide that support, uh, academic support using technology. Are there still kids out that still feel the need to not come in? We still have about 125 kids out that they were participating in the remote academy. Uh, these are kids with medical issues, so they are still until June. As you know, during my tenure, I had another pandemic issue, and is that the year that the pandemic came to the world, we also began with a cybersecurity uh, hack in the district. And again, I want to give credit to our IT department, the uh, technicians that were there, that they worked 24 seven to make sure that we brought the system back uh, to work because the staff is willing to work, but we got to pay them. So uh, we wanted to make sure that we have everything ready uh, to provide, it, provide them with the support. We have a partnership we're implementing with CrowdStrike, uh, our uh, system is monitored every minute, right Tom? To make sure that uh, there's no hacking. I can tell you that sometimes we receive thousands of uh, attempts during the day, so our staff has been great monitoring that and making sure that uh, hackers do not have access to information in the district. And with that, we also are implementing if no before, and that is a way that we're sending messages, emails to the staff in the district to see if they open those emails and if they do what the email is asking them to do that they're not supposed to, like, you know, providing some information. So and we just remind people that, you know, we're doing this because we don't want to com want you to be compromised and we don't want the district to be uh, also compromised. In the area of transportation, transportation has been a, an issue, especially this year, uh, not only in Syracuse, but all the district in your state and all over the uh, country. There's very few people who want to be drivers. So we have been working to uh, with first student to try to get more drivers. We work with the governor's office. To, uh, we got a list of people interested in the area of being drivers to try to recruit more drivers for the district. Uh, we implemented a new transportation software, TransFinders, that uh, help us be more efficient in the way that we're writing our students. Uh, we have 20,000 kids in the district and there are about 2,500 uh, also in the charter schools and parochial. We transport 16,557 students every day in the Syracuse City School District. Uh, 11,000 are yellow buses or first students uh, 4,000 are with Central. We have 11, uh, 1,000 students uh, that they attend 27 uh, non-public schools in the city. Uh, 387 of those are on Central and 618 are on the yellow buses. So every day there are 153 daily bus routes in the district without uh, athletics. So we are working for next year. Sorry. Excuse our manners. We should have offered you some water. Uh, that's okay. Right, Joe. Pat. Who's running this meeting? Oh, that's okay. Go there, that's right. <laughs> Be gentle. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they're watching everything. Don't worry. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, Marco Rubio moment there. Okay. <laughs> uh, for next year, but instead of. Uh, two uh, times when we bring the kids in the morning or take home, we have three in the morning and three in the afternoon to make sure that we have enough drivers. So uh, some kids will get to school quarter to eight, other kids will start at around 8.15, and other at quarter to nine. So we wanna make sure uh, that we have enough time between the routes to go and pick up kids and take them to 
the different schools and to do the same thing at the end of the day. Uh, we also have kids that participate in extracurricular activities, so we want to make sure that we have the drivers to take the kids to the games. In the area of security, uh, this is a, an area that the board also had made a commitment. We have added more centuries to the school, so we have 79 uh, and a half positions, uh, centers in the school. We have five and a half, you may ask, a half position guards that are also in central office. We have 11 home monitor, and we have six school information resource officers at the high school. Uh, we do daily entry searches at all our high schools, and we do random searches in the middle schools. Uh, I know that during the last uh, two weeks, we have been aware of different things that are happening in our community and other communities throughout the nation. Uh, the health and safety of our students and our staff is one of my priority and a priority of uh, the boards of, of education. And I also know that it's a priority for the common council and the mayor. So we're working together to make sure that when the kids are in school, they're safe and the support is there. For next year, we are uh, recommending to add more centuries for all the schools. Also, we are going to be uh, bringing a plan to the board next week. I'm not gonna get into all the details of that because I gotta go to the board first. But we wanna make sure that our kids are uh, safe and our staff also is safe and that they feel safe. Uh, we know that for our staff, we have ID, so the only way that the staff can get into the building is through using their ID. So uh, we have single point of entry in every building. Uh, we are making sure that our sentries are going around and checking that all the doors, the other doors are locked at all time. We have a Raptor system that is used in every building uh, for vis visitors when they come in, they go in in the office, they sign, and we can do a check to see if there's anything uh, that we need to be aware, uh, be aware of. So again, the health and safety of our students and staff is a priority for all of us in the district and in the city, and we are working to make sure that they continue to be safe. Superintendent, oh, I'm sorry, President. Yes. So when you say the doors are, all the doors are locked, I get that. But in case of an emergency, if they push that door, it's going to open, correct? Yeah. Okay. They're locked from outdoors okay. to get into the building. Uh, but they are able, if, some, if there's a fire drill, if there's anything, they are able to go out. This is like... The exits are in each school, do you know? Or, or approximately <laughs> four... Oh, no, no. no. Uh, at the elementary level, probably there are between four to six exit. Uh, at the middle school, it could be between eight, 10, 16. Uh, at Henniger, it like 20 exit. There are different uh, doors throughout the building. So, Superintendent, can a, pro a door be propped open and nobody know about it? Except, uh, could, I mean, were that like, would there be, is there some sort of technical thing that would show on like uh, the principal's office that that door is open? What we have done in some of those areas that we don't have uh, a sentry in that area, we have installed uh, alarms in those doors. So when someone pops open the door, the alarm will go off and someone will hear that and respond immediately to that. And I want to ask you one other question. I mean, I know you're probably, you know, friends with Chief Cecil and I would like, I wonder if there's any kind of you know, in the past, there's always been a little friction between the uh, police chief and the superintendent of schools over, over the years. I, I don't foresee that happening now, but mm. I, of course, I would urge your security people and Chief Cecil to get together so in case there's any response, you know, or, yeah. or any best practices that can be implemented from the city police and, of course, the, you know, as far as the education department goes. Yeah, we have a great relationship. One of the good things. That's not required, right? One of the good things between Chief Cecil and I is that we can see eye to eye <laughs> each other. So <laughs> he said he was taller than you. Uh, uh, it, 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 it depends. It depends on you know uh, on the day. So you know, so just kidding. We, we were joking. All set aside. I mean, last week uh, we do have a great uh, partnership, great communication. Last week when there was the incident that happened at uh, Ed Smith, he came to the district. We both had a press conference together Excellent. and that's what we need to do. People need to see that we're working together for the safety of all our kids and the safety of the staff and the resident in, uh, in the city. We gotta have 
open ongoing communication. Uh, there were some things that happened over the weekend. He sent me a text, so we are communicating on a daily basis. He has my number, I have his number, so we are always uh, communicating with each other. And in the past, you know, we, we always have good communication with uh, with the police department. Sometimes it could have gotten better, but again, with Chief Cecil, I mean, yesterday, sent me an email, this happened, I just wanted to know about this, 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 and some other people uh, here at City Hall. Uh, in some cases, I have called the deputy mayor, and you know we have communicated, and she gets in contact with other people. I have called uh, the mayor, so it's clear, transparent communication between uh, the district and uh, city hall. And in my case, it's just calling you. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, uh, a good lawyer can take care of that. <laughs> Media were just. It's a long day, sir. It is a good pair of shoes, I get, right? <laughs> I mean, boots, you can put some, you know, things down there, but I'm not, I'm not gonna argue for an inch or half an inch or a quarter of an inch, you know? It's the work that we can do together to support our city and our community. I have one question for, God willing, nothing happens in the schools here, but as far as the active shooting, um, process if something was happening in schools, are we continue to update and uh, making sure that you know everyone's trained um, on that process, even in like you know big arenas, like if it was like a, a basketball game or a football game, that you know people that work outside of the school but come into school understands what to do with active shooting. Yeah, we have been working with uh, Sonia Suigo since the tragedy that happened in Parkland, Florida. So they have been providing. Uh, training for our staff in the district, standard res response protocol. So we do that in every building every year, even during COVID, we did that. We continue to do that and be committed to uh, a, to make sure that our staff knows what to do during those events. We do have an emergency management plan that we have to submit to the state uh, that include every single area like what about if something happened, it's a shooting? What about if it's an explosion? What about, you know, and we're gonna be uh, hosting a co-video chat with our families uh, next week to let them know about the plan. We won't be discussing all the areas because, you know, then, but for people to know that we do have a plan and there's something that we must do in order to make sure that our schools are safe and that their kids are safe with us, so. Thank you. You're welcome. And Councilor Paniagua said, please speak into the mics because everybody sounds muffled. Mm. <laughs> okay. okay. I'm trying. In the, uh, in the area of food and nutrition, I mean, is another department that they have done a great job, not only uh, every year, but especially do the, during the pandemic. Uh, we have increased the number of kids in the district uh, we used to be like 72% of kids that qualify for free and reduced lunch. This year, we're already at 82.7% of our kids. Uh, the poverty in the city is high, continues to increase. So our uh, food service department prepares and provides 16,000 lunches a day for uh, students in the district and about 11,000 uh, breakfasts. So our department is busy every single day. We do the breakfast program, we do the lunch program, we do the child and adult care food program for at risk supper, uh, supper program. We have the after school snack program for the kids that are in the after school program. We had the fresh fruit and vegetable program for our students and during the summer we have summer uh, feeder program. So we are planning in opening 39 different sites this coming summer, whether they are in our schools, community centers, parks and rec facilities, to make sure that no one goes hungry during the during the summer. Okay, I said I was going to be quiet, but I really can't. Let me ask you this question. So when you talk about the feeding programs, the majority of that comes through what? The federal government? Federal money. Okay, yes. so does the school district have to contribute anything or is it no, all? It's all federal grant that's come from the, uh, through the state, federal through the state to the district to provide services to our kids. Thank you. 
basics, okay. We also work with other agencies and we have the backpack program uh, that we do uh, the press conference in front of City Hall. Uh, mayor very supportive of that. So we provide uh, meals, backpack to 2,000 kids for the weekend that they take home uh, for them. So uh, our food service department is excellent, making sure that no kids goes hungry in our district. And our finance department, uh, one of the commitment that we made when I became superintendent was to get more input from uh, all our stakeholders, whether it was the students, the families, the staff, the administrators, everyone. So we began the implementation of Balancing Act. So Chief uh, Slack has been great getting feedback from students, uh, student cabinet, from the teachers advisory committee, uh, from the uh, superintendents, family, uh, parent council. Uh, we, in the past, we were able to do uh, different sessions throughout the community. We went to each side of town at the high school to get feedback. Uh, we shared with them the money that we're projecting to receive, uh, and we give them an idea of how we are planning spending that money, but they have the opportunity to tell us, you know what, mm -mm. you should not be putting more money in this area, you should be putting more money in this other area. You should, should not be buying textbooks anymore, you should be buying laptops so we can have access to the textbooks and all that. So our students, our staff, they have been great providing us input on how to spend money because that is an area that everyone is an expert. You give them the suggestions and they will let you know. So uh, they are telling us that we needed to put more money on mental health and social emotional support, uh, that we needed to increase technology and training on how to use that technology also. Uh, ask kids, for feedback and they're very honest. They told us that we needed to change the school menu. You know, they said, you know, that macaroni and cheese is not good. You gotta get rid of that and <laughs> give us something else, you know. We had the <laughs> we had the kids going to uh, OCC for a summer program at OCC on site and they love the chicken tenders at OCC. So our food service department is working to provide the same tenders that they provide at OCC. <laughs> And they also said that we need air conditioning in all the classrooms in the district. Uh, again, during the pandemic, uh, we took the health and safety very seriously and we put uh, air purifiers in every single classroom and in the cafeteria library. Now they're asking for air conditioning in all those areas. Uh, the district, going to the extra money that also uh, the city received, the federal stimulus money, uh, we received $157 million, uh, $48 million from CERSA, and $108 from ARPA. And that money is being used to support uh, learning acceleration in the district, uh, social emotional programs and support, air quality, safety, and security, uh, buying more equipment, again, technology, and provide more professional development for our staff. Uh, we want to make sure that our staff is ready to teach our kids and engage our kids every single day. So that is part of the work that we have done in the Syracuse City School District during the last six years as the superintendent and cabinet of the Syracuse City School District. Thank you, any questions? Thank you. So I have a couple of them. Um, and I don't know if, if any one of you, but um, going back to, to, to the five priorities that you had set, uh, that you had set superintendent, um, one of them being uh, engagement of families and, and the community, specifically for families. Um, it's, it's great during pandemic that the graduation has increased. And I'm wondering, you know, in, in terms of getting into pandemic, you know, what were some of the barriers to engaging parents, the, you know? 
As I said before, uh, one of the lessons that we learned for during COVID is that engaging parents, they don't have to come in in person to the school. And those call video chats were instrumental for us communicating with the families. Another area that worked great was our parent, uh, our program aid. These are great uh, staff members that are not afraid of getting out of their comfort zone and they're going home to do visit on visit to work with the families at home to refer them to other community agencies. So these are people that are on hand working with the families and uh, providing that extra support. We also have the other agencies, like I mentioned before with Hillside, that will continue to work with us. Uh, Arise, uh, the Syracuse Community Health Center and the School-Based Health Center. So we learn a lot and we will continue to do that. We will continue to do COVID chat in the future, even if everyone is back in person, because that has been uh, a great initiative that uh, has worked for us. And I also have to give credit as a community uh, partnership to Wegmans Pharmacy. Wegmans has hosted more than 35 clinics in our buildings to provide the clinic, the booster and the booster, not only to our students, to our families, but also to our staff. So it's a lot of work that we have learned and that we will continue to do in the future. Anything that I forgot, Monique, about family engagement? Okay. I ask that because I think, you know, one of the most important element in helping kids, you know, finish solid or graduate is, is you can't subtract parental engagement from that equation. And it seemed like during pandemic there are things as you said things that have worked and i'm wondering if we if you have transitioned that rather than you know the way the old way you used to do it have you transitioned and incorporate those stuff now that instead of writing letters to parents you are telecommunicating with them and making sure that there, there is that routine you know yes uh with zoom with teams we're able to have the kids the staff and the parents right in front of us and have those conversations with them and to get feedback from them so that is something that we will continue to uh use in the district yeah and you you they, 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 there have been a resp good response from 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 that perspective i know hoggy would have challenged right yes and not only <laughs> and not only uh the opportunity for us to share all the plans all the information with the families in different languages is also there so uh for the opening of the school year i had five six different meetings i mean one time for the arabic family another time uh for the nepali so another one for spanish so i was able to share the information and someone was there with me to uh translate for the family so it gave us that uh, opportunity can I follow up on that question? So this parent university, which I think sounds brilliant, especially with engaging parents like and families like you mentioned, counselor, um, is the parent university really just a series of those co-video chats or is there more than what you've stated on this slide? It is more than co-video chats. It's more than co-video chats and I will introduce to talk a little more. I mean, we have to go back to bring parent university the way it was in the past when we have a, a director but uh, Chief William was in charge of Parent University. You want to talk about some of the workshops that the family engagement facilitators are doing and everything? Okay. Um, so thank you. Uh, Parent University. That's mic, mic. Yep. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Or you can come sit. <laughs> no, <laughs> this is fine. So Parent University um, started several years ago. Co-video chats came as a result of the titling itself is COVID and video. And so that's where the co-video came from initially. So a way of reaching out to families um, during the, the pandemic. Prior to that, we'd have parent university classes on pretty the same stuff that you have there, but whatever is pertinent for families to be made aware of, whether that was school district related, personal life related. We partner with agencies and do information about housing and rental assistance and whatever families need we make it a point to offer them. We get feedback from them in terms of what they would like. But even before the pandemic, we'd noticed that when we held a session and we live streamed it, mm -hmm. we had more people in the room. 
And so COVID gave us the opportunity of exclusively uh, live streaming, but people are dying to return to in-person. Mm -hmm. So we will hybrid it. We will offer it virtually, but also allow people to come into the space. We usually provide childcare. We provide meals if it's an evening um, event or if it's a lunch and learn, we provide them a lunch meal as well. So Parent University is a lot of different pieces of information and needs that meets our families. Um, do you record those co-video chats? And do yes, they are them? recorded. They all can be found on our webpage. Awesome. So you can just, if you miss it, you can click on it and you'd get the same presentation. And we also live stream them on Facebook during the co-video. So you could, you could also go back to the Facebook page if you were on Facebook and see it that way. I mean, when you see those graduation rates going up, you have to give credit to the parent university because the more you engage the families, it has to help improve those numbers. Oh, we'll so take that credit. Awesome job. <laughs> awesome job. Sorry, teaching and learning. No, just kidding. <laughs> it's teamwork. It's teamwork. Uh, again, we got to get the parents engaged from pre-K all the way to high school. Mm -hmm. From pre-K all the way to high school. Now, where do you see, is there any any gaps that could be filled by any policy work here in this area at all? Again, uh, I have to say that well, during, state then, maybe the, during my tenure, uh, I have been lucky to uh, work with City Hall and that, that we have been able to communicate on a daily basis. Whenever something happens, I mean, there's ongoing uh, clear communication between myself and the mayor. We have monthly meeting to talk about what is going on. Uh, I'm not afraid of calling uh, the president of the common council or other counselors. And I mean, we are Syracuse, we're here. We need to work together. We need to have ongoing clear communication. And I have to say that, you know, every time that I call one of you or that I call the mayor or the deputy mayor, you guys always take my call, so I appreciate that. Uh, there's some things that we need to work together. I mean, uh, it is our city, it is our community, uh, and we need to get the message out there that this is not the school district fault, that this is not the city hall fault, that we are citizens and that we are in this business together, and that we need to work together, put our thought together to make a difference. But together, we need to make people accountable. We need to make people accountable because there's some things that are happening that you know people like to do this. We got to make sure that we are standing together so we can continue to make a difference in our city and our community. And if I could add, Councilor Majorca, and I'm sure President Hudson remembers it, it wasn't always like this. No. Well, when I was first on the council, there was almost an ongoing cold war between the city school district and city hall. No. And over the years, especially with your leadership and through the first joint school construction board, the cooperation is amazing between school, the school district, the common councils, and at this administration particularly. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking about the deputy mayor talking about our housing initiatives and mm -hmm. how the council supports those things, building up those neighborhoods. It's like we're build, trying to build those neighborhoods to work with the schools and mm -hmm. your commitment to Blodgett and of course to Fowler, which was a tremendous fight that we had to, to get that built. You know, yeah. when actually the, there was raw sewage going into the cafeteria, mm -hmm. when, mm -hmm. you know, and a lot of people on the, President Hudson, all of us fought for that, the funding for that, and just a vehicle for doing that. So that's all under you. And I have no problem saying that the, your cooperation and your leadership has made a big difference in this city, a huge difference in this city. I congratulate you. Thank you, thank you. And then I got a lot a last question. I got plenty of, of them, but I, I'll leave them for later. We're running out of time. Um, <laughs> just, <laughs> I have read around a couple of empirical work that suggests that part of a community fighting crimes is somehow finding a way to have uh, youth or at least young adults you know, uh, or 16, 17, 18 year old uh, kids be connected to their communities. 
mm -hmm. right? And then somehow they, they, they develop attachment to their community because and have I respect. I think this is worth a, a committee meeting because <laughs> it's deeper than the school district. Yeah, no, I, 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 I'm going to work that, with the kids, and, and I think everybody needs to be in the same room okay. because they can't account for what. No, no, I, I'm, going I'm going somewhere with it, Madam President. I'm going somewhere with it. Uh, and which, which is something that, that is super, I think superintendent would answer. Uh, um, so as, as, as you help kids develop attachment to their own community, um, there are places that have suggested that maybe one of, one of the ways to do that is to allow kids to uh, often volunteer within their own community, either through curriculum where kids are asked to to, as part of their credit and part of their, their graduation to, to, to somewhat volunteer within the community and do work in the community. Now, I've been out of, out of high school for a while, you know, so I don't know, do, do the school district we, does that we at all? We changed the name of the course. It's not participation in government anymore. It's called active citizenship, and that is still one of the requirements for our kids to do volunteer work uh, in our community. But again, I want to give credit uh, uh, to Councillor Cowell, mm -hmm. I mean, she gave me a call about working together for a partnership to support our kids, came and met with us, and we said, yeah, we're in uh, to provide our kids, not only at the high school level, but also at the middle school level, the opportunity to get involved uh, this summer, to participate in different programs, uh, financial literacy, do community work, make a difference, and you know get some uh stipend for participating in that program we want to make sure that the kids take pride in our community this is our community this is their community we're getting older more seasoned but we got to teach them <laughs> we got to teach them that you know what the same way that we took care of them when they were growing up when we are moving to the next stage, they gotta be able to support us because someone has gotta have to come in and support them. So that's the way, that's the cycle of life and we gotta work together and partnership. I mean, we gotta work together. Uh, we have facilities that, you know, uh, our uh, facility at Fowler is being used almost every day. People are asking for that facility for years and years. And the same thing with the Nottingham facility. So we got to work together, but there's got to be, again, some communication and some accountability in our community. You mentioned you had infinity groups. Affinity groups, yes. Okay, so do you have, like, huh, how do I say this, uh, merging leaders or anything of that magnitude for new teachers coming in through the affinity groups? We have provided uh, for new teachers orientation and we have provided support and that's one of the things that uh, Gina Versa does that she keeps in track with them and our HR department. We also have a Syracuse Leadership Academy uh, for people who want to be administrators in the district and they spend a year uh, going through some training, getting to know the district, getting to know the data, getting to know the community and we have uh, Executive Director Penn Odom and Assistant Executive Director Tara Jennings that they have been working uh, with those staff during these years on Saturdays or in the evening uh, working with them so we are providing support to them. And I know diversity is coming. So, what is the diversity in the school in the Syracuse City School District? Uh, our, I can say that we're almost seventy percent minority in the district. About fifty-eight percent African American. Uh, we have eighty uh, seventeen percent of our kids are ENL students, English language learning. Uh, we have about twenty percent of our kids that are kids with special needs. So, we have a very diverse student populations. Our students speak uh, 82, 72 different languages. Our staff is not at the same level, but that's one of our uh, efforts to continue to recruit and diversify our staff in the district, whether it's in the classroom, whether it's in the custodial staff, whether it's in the cafeteria. We want our kids to be able to see that there we have the staff that look like them. Other questions? All right, the UCNY, that will do it for us. Thank, Thank you. you for Thank coming. You. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. <laughs>